Thanks. Well, good morning, and thank you, Daniel. I think with all that you said, I could probably sit down and... <laughs> but, uh, yeah, thank you for having us here. It's really good to be here, to finally meet you, Daniel, and your family. Uh, we've heard a bit about you. Our son-in-law goes back a, a ways with Daniel, so um, maybe we'll hear a few stories later. It's my privilege to share something of missions this morning from our perspective as Ethnos New Zealand. And the first thing I want you to know about Ethnos is that this is translated from the Greek word that has uh, been used throughout the New Testament, translated as nations, peoples, Gentiles and heathen. It's also where we get our English word ethnic from. For our first 75 years, we were known as New Tribes Mission with the classic look of our founding works among the jungle pe tribal people of the world. Today, they are still our core focus, and you can get a really good idea of what this all looks like in our video God at Work on our website. There's a link to it, and to make it easy so you don't have to remember that, you can take one of these cards with that link on it. We've got them on the table over there, along with a few other bits and pieces. Um, just uh, last week, we have a brand new church in Papua New Guinea. You can read about that on the front page of some bulletins we have there. We also have magazines that you can take a free copy and help yourself to that at the table and talk to us after. We also work among many other ethnic people groups that otherwise have no access to the gospel. Think about that, no access at all to the gospel. The ethnos of the world are as varied as the places they're found and up there you see something that just represents what God has our organisation working amongst. So, Ethnos New Zealand, we are a tiny wee part of what it takes to establish a thriving church for every people. This is all God's work, but he does it in a partnership with his people, and therefore, like all good partnerships, we like to give young people an opportunity to explore if this is something that God might have for them. So check out this short video clip. I've come here for a purpose to learn as much as I can about cross-cultural missions. There's a church back at home that are praying for me and supporting me. I spent a lot of this past year just being really anxious and worried about the future and just the uncertainty that's there. But being able to come here and just focus on God's word and to kind of get away from all these distractions that are back in, in America um, has really just been able to give me some perspective and allow me to say, hey, God's got this. I love hearing how these missionaries have gone into these tribal places and the situations they've gone through. And I think what stands out and also really encouraging is hearing their struggles through it all and hearing how in every single case God has provided, that helps us as students so as long as we put our hope and our strength in Christ that we can go through it as well. I have grown up reading and hearing a lot of stories of cross-cultural missions. What I've really enjoyed is interacting with other young people and families and Christians who love God and have a passion for missions. That's been really exciting for me. Uh, it's not about me making sure that I do what's most comfortable or what I'm most familiar with, but it's how God would choose to use me. So every day when we go and then we practice the pidgin language or we go out to the tribe and it's uncomfortable trying to practice the language, I remember that it's not, it's not about me and that it's difficult, but it's definitely worth it to, to serve God in this way. For me, it's I want to serve God 
but God is teaching me, okay, it is not about where you want to go, it's about where God wants me to go. I don't have a big role in his plan, I'm just one person he can use, can use for his plan. It's not about me, it's about him. So who would like to go to that? We have uh, flyers about that on the table as well. If you are interested in finding out more about that, or if you know somebody who is looking to how they could experience missions, that is a fantastic way to do it. June, July, each year in Papua New Guinea. So talk to us later, ask us more, and please let other people know. Registrations are just about full already for next year. Okay, now, did you know that Auckland Sky Tower is the tallest structure in the Southern Hemisphere? At a height of 328 metres to the tip of its mast, it just beats the Eiffel Tower by four metres. It would have to grow another 88 metres to match what New York's Twin Towers used to be, and it's only a baby compared to Dubai's Burj Khalifa at an incredible 828 metres. So that's two and a half times the height of ours, and there's ours to scale. Now, I remember watching the excavations for this tower, and from the Victoria Street construction barrier, I could see this massive hole that they were digging. It turns out that there is 16 metres of foundation down into the bedrock below basement level. So that is one huge foundation, and it has to be for the magnitude 8 earthquakes, 200 kilometre hour winds that it's been designed to withstand. We all know that foundations are important. So let's leave this now and let's head to Caesarea Philippi at the time that Jesus walked that dusty road and we will go to Matthew chapter 16 verses 13 to 18. We're going to look at a very different sort of building and its foundation. So Matthew 16 verses 13 to 18, I'll have the words on the screen here as well. Verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by men, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So what we've just read there is Peter's great confession of faith, and this is where we also find out where Jesus will on what Jesus will be building. There is a whole lot in this passage, and this morning we're just going to skim across the top of it, perhaps a little differently, because we're going to look at it from a missions perspective on Jesus' statement, I will build my church. So like any building project, we're going to look at this in three areas, the foundation, the construction, and the completion. So let's go straight to the foundation. Now, Jesus, knowing all along that there was confusion about who he really is, like we saw in verse 14, he then gets to the point that he wants to make with his disciples when he says, who do you say I am? And then Peter speaks up in verse 16, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, when Peter says the Christ, what he's saying there is, you are the anointed one the one that's been promised all through the, from the beginning, the promised Messiah throughout all of the Old Testament prophecies, and here he was as the son to ascend the throne. 
This is not just an assertion from a dear ancestor. This is through the living God who lives from everlasting to everlasting. So Peter got it right. There was plenty of others around him who had some good ideas. Some of them even sounded religious, but they were miles from the truth. And I like the way this pastor said it. Some said he was a rabbi. They ignored him. Some called him a prophet. They treated him like the other prophets and didn't do what he said. Some say today he's a great teacher, a religious leader, a great historical figure, a tragic revolutionary. They want to dismiss him, avoid him, bury him. But the trouble is he keeps showing up and asking, who do you say I am? So how about us? Who do we say he is? See, first off, this determines our eternal destiny. If we don't know him and what he's done to save us from our sins, we are cut off from him for eternity in hell. The starting point is to know him for who he is and what he's done to deliver us. Then when we know him, we will apply. When we do know him, the way we answer who is Jesus that will determine how we live in this world. If we see him as the greatest teacher, we will apply everything that he teaches, not just pick and choose those bits that suit us or that we want. If we see him as only a great miracle worker to give us that next good thing that we demand for a more comfortable life, our self-centeredness will lock us out of much of what he has planned for us we'll miss out on that ultimate joy it is to serve him with little reward out ahead. If we see him as the Christ, the son of the living God, we will be happy to live under his authority as a servant to the greatest king, filling some role of service and making disciples wherever we happen to be. Now the disciples, they grew to understand that Jesus is God in the flesh. They saw his divinity shine through in the glory of the transfiguration, in the raising of Lazarus from the dead, and in his testimony that he existed before Abraham. But at the same time, his complete humanity is completely evident when he rebukes Peter, when he angrily clears out the temple, when he weeps at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. See, he's fully God and he's fully human, a fact that is foundational to our faith. A sure foundation for us as we build against those wings of false doctrine and as we withstand today's earthquakes of compromise. This is a sure foundation that originates from outside of us, just like it did for Peter. And Jesus said it this way in verse 17. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. See, he didn't get it from man. He didn't get it from a book. And guess what? He didn't get it from Google. It came from above, and that is the reinforcing steel of truth of how Jesus is revealed to any of us. Jesus himself said in John 6.65, No one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. And that applies to us two millennia on. You know, we, we are far removed from the time that Jesus walked amongst his disciples, and yet we are those that he refers to. You'll remember his conversation with Thomas when he said, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. John 20, 29. So because of understanding who Jesus is and how that's revealed to us, because this is so foundational to our faith, look what, Peter, look what Jesus says next to Peter in verse 18. I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. So here we have the first mention of the church, which has been translated from ecclesia, which means the outcall. The called out ones into Jesus' representative body here on earth. 
and like a building. This has to happen on the correct foundation, otherwise it's going to end up looking more like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. So to avoid something like this, Jesus is very particular about the foundation on which he is building his church. It's on this rock, the rock-solid truth of Peter's statement that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus himself is the foundation, and in the Greek, he makes this crystal clear in a bit of wordplay. He uses Peter's Greek name Petros, and that means a small stone. A stone for throwing, it's a small piece off a much larger rock. And then he draws out against Petra, which means a large stone or rock, a cliff or a bed rock, that can never be removed. See, Christ is the foundation. That applies to Peter, that applies to us, and that applies to any of the churches that our ethnos church planters have any part in. So once the Sky Tower foundation was laid, then the construction began, and each new level was built on the previous. This also happens for us. When we grasp something, then the Lord continues to build on that into our lives, and then more can follow, right? For Peter, because he understood who Jesus is, he was now ready to have the cross begin to be revealed to him in the verses that follow our text. This would continue to be built on until the time Jesus ascended back to the Father. By that time, the cross was no longer a mystery, but fully revealed and understood as the only way to the Father. A few more verses after this, Jesus goes on to teach more about servanthood and sacrifice. And then into the next chapter, three of them see a small glimpse of Jesus in his future glory when he's transfigured on the mountain. See, this is all a level by level upward growth. And this is the same for us. The Holy Spirit always has more that he wants to grow into us. But for this to happen, we do have to live as learners. The second thing in this Petros Petra payoff here is something of outward construction. Jesus makes it very clear that Peter will become instrumental in establishing the church, and throughout the New Testament we see that Christ builds his church through his apostles, through their teaching, and their writings. So in effect, this is a privileged partnership with his people. Think about it this way. With our sky tower, was it just one man or one company that built that? No way. There was hundreds of people on site. And then there was all of the sub-trades, all the service and supply companies. There was thousands of people involved. And this is the idea of partnership that the Lord uses in building his church. And we see this especially in missions. It's an amazing truth, when you think about it, that the creator of the universe, the architect and builder of the church, would allow human help in this task. And yet that is exactly what he does. As weak and insignificant as we are, he invites us and he has a part for every one of us to be involved with him. Isn't that incredible? Like Hudson Taylor said, God uses men who are weak and feeble enough to lean on him. The local church is tasked for outward construction by its members through outreach and witnessing, and then all that it takes to support that, whether it's frontline or background, it's all part of it. In missions, the outward construction of the church is really quite diverse. In our case, it begins with our missionaries having to learn at least one language, often two, and then many times convert that into written form for the first time in history. Literacy teachers preparing the people to read so that as the scriptures are translated, they will be able to read and study it for themselves. Then there's the cross-cultural Bible teacher who brings a clear gospel message to avoid syncretism. 
when we served in the Philippines, and there's our village, because we were so far out in the jungle, we relied on others who would buy our supplies. We relied on pilots who would bring them in, along with project materials, medical supplies for the people, sometimes even extra food for the people if they had had a bad harvest. We relied on IT people to keep our computers up to date and running in very difficult conditions. We relied on guest house managers for clean, affordable place to stay when we did come out to town, or like when we brought tribal people out to get them treated in the hospital. There's Judy with Jusselin when we stayed in the city for a few weeks so that her daughter, Angelina, could get some eye surgery to prevent her going blind like her two older sisters. A very happy day for her and a relief for her mum when that was all done. We relied on administration people to keep us legally in the country with visas and so on. Accountants to make sure that our support got to us and not given to everybody else on the field. We saw how the Lord sent us funds through local churches and individuals and we saw how God raised up people who seriously prayed for us our co-workers and the people that we worked with. And those last two, supporters and prayers based right here at home, but equally a part of what God is doing, part of God's team. Whatever way we are involved in missions or within the local church, if it's looking to share Jesus or disciple his people, whether it's frontline or background, this is in a partnership with him as he builds his church. <coughs> so what are we building into this morning? After all, we are being built up so that we will build out. And that always begins in the local context first. Then the Lord will draw from what he's doing in the local context for what he's doing among the nations and Ethnos New Zealand is very happy to facilitate more co-workers into what the construction of the church looks like globally. Now lastly, let's have a look at something of the completion of his church. In any building project, the anticipation of completion is what drives those who are involved. And it's obviously what excites any onlookers. Certainly the opening day of the Sky Tower had long been anticipated and the day finally arrived through many challenges and no doubt many setbacks along the way. Any injuries or disputes that happened during construction, they didn't stop the tower reaching its completion. And so too with the church that Jesus is building. It was planned for way back in eternity past and as Jesus unrolls the blueprint before his disciples, he makes this assurance, the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And a common interpretation on this would be the gates of Hades is figurative for the power of Satan and his forces, the powers of hell, who are opposed to anything and everything that God is doing. But then, since Jesus has defeated Satan, these powers cannot prevail against the building of the church. And a number of our English Bible translations use the word hell for the Greek Hades. And that helps to drive us to that conclusion. And there's some really good theology there. But there is a weak problem with that interpretation. Hell is not a good translation for Hades. Hades is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Sheol, both of which always mean the grave, the unseen place of the dead never Satan's place of power. In the context of just a few verses later, Jesus is foretelling his death and resurrection. And right there is the key to understand that even though all of us who make up the church will pass through those gates of death, those gates are not going to hold us. Jesus' own resurrection was shortly to burst them wide open, reversing the hold on death. And then just out ahead, like him, we, his church, will have these old bodies of ours raised from the dead to be reunited with him in new glorified bodies. 
And as we get older, we say amen to that, right? As encouraging as that all is, we still do face much opposition from Satan. Ephesians 6.12 plainly tells us our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Notice that? From the heavenly realms or the spiritual realms, Satan is very active in all manner of attacks against the church with brutal persecutions, especially overseas. But Satan cannot overcome the church because it is firmly built on Jesus and on the power of his resurrection. This is a guaranteed completion that Revelation 7-9 describes as a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. So how good is that going to be? Can you imagine the gratitude of the multitude for his sacrifice in our place? Can you imagine the delight Jesus' delight at his full body of believers there with him in person in glorified bodies with him for the rest of eternity. And get this, outside of a sin environment. How good is that going to be? All because of what Jesus has accomplished as he has been building his church. Similar for us with the completion of the Sky Tower, if we want, we can enjoy a view of Auckland while we're dining high above the city, or if we're game enough, we can even sky jump from it, even if we didn't contribute in any way to any part of its construction. So how much more is the excitement of completion if any of us are apart with Christ as he builds his church here locally or overseas in missions? Judy and I were privileged to be a real tiny stone-sized part in all it took to help our co-workers get the Agusan Manobo New Testament to print. Now the joy and fulfilment that we found in that and that we still find today as we travel sharing what God's doing, the joy, that joy and fulfilment is what you will often hear old retired missionaries saying, I wish I was young enough to do it all again. And we're getting old enough, we're starting to say that. God has used countless people through Ethnos New Zealand and our global partners around the world who have a heart for a thriving church for every people. Collectively, we've had the privilege of seeing more than 1,200 churches planted among more than 260 people groups Complete churches looking something like the Tanga Under Church that New Zealanders Jason and Shirley Birkin have invested their lives into in the Philippines since 1983. They have already translated the New Testament. These days they are translating the Old Testament. Here is the Manjui people of Paraguay receiving their New Testament in 2015. The dedication of the Dom New Testament in Papua New Guinea 2015, sorry, 16. The Yao people of Mozambique who first heard the gospel in their language in 2016. The Infant Iski Church also in Papua New Guinea with their first baptisms in May 2018, all 83 of them. The Wana Church of Indonesia that now sends out indigenous missionaries of their own to three different language and culture groups. The Guahaba people of Colombia who continue to meet faithfully even though guerrillas forced them out of their village. There's many other examples I could give you of what Jesus is doing to bring his church to completion. So this morning, how about us? Are we personally at completion stage yet? Now, we know that this is not going to happen until glory. But as far as the lessons that the Lord has for us, are we allowing him to grow us? And are we some part 
some aspect of completion with Jesus as he builds his church. One day, the only thing left that any of us will have to show for our life on earth will be a tombstone. We don't get too excited thinking about that, do we? It will have our name, it will have our birth date, it will have our date of death. Maybe it will have a Bible verse, and if people like us, maybe they'll say something nice about us. But that's it. Birth date, dash, death date. And that little dash is all it shows for our entire life here on earth. What is going to be behind our quick dash through life? So let's wrap up here. Jesus said, I will build my church. And we saw that this is squarely set on the foundation of who he is and what he has done for our entry to it. Construction is the process for followers of Jesus. As we grow to the point where we become invited to partner with him as he builds his church. And then completion is guaranteed because no matter what happens in the process, nothing is going to overcome this. So whatever part we may have, whatever part God has us serving in today, let's be encouraged this morning to go home and not give up. We are on the winning team. And if we are considering something new, maybe the Lord has something new he wants for us, someone here. Let's go home with the fact that he will use any of us who are willing to be a part with him as he builds his church. So I want to thank you for the privilege of being able to bring this message today. And I trust the Lord will use that for his glory. Thank you, Daniel. Well, praise the Lord for Trevor and Judy's ministry and for that inspiring message. And uh, let's let's uh, close in prayer before we sing our final uh, hymn. Let's let's pray. Thank you so much, Lord, for the inspiration, Lord, of how you are building your church throughout the world. And thank you for the labour of those missionaries that we saw, Lord, in these in those pictures, uh, who are working faithfully day after day, week after week to see your word translated into the heart language of the people that they are serving with. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you stir people's hearts to serve you in this way. Lord, I pray that you would stir our hearts to to join in this work through support, through prayer, through giving, and through going. And Lord, I pray that you would build your church in those nations and build your church here in Hamilton, Lord. May we also have a, a similar desire to see those around us to turn, to turn to Christ, to have the word in their own hearts and to hear your word spoken and to read your word and to, to join in, in our church and other churches here in Hamilton, Lord. Please do a great work amongst our, our fellowship, Lord, as we seek to see you building your church and seek to see your commands of going to the nations and teach, baptizing, teaching them, Lord, and making disciples of them. May this be true of us in our midst, Lord, and in our church. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We now sing our final hymn, hymn number 296.